Welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, Lesson 75, John 7. You know, yesterday we began to actually, for the first time, dig into the seven I M's. Uh, the first one was, and we, we based this off of Mindy's painting, also found in John 6, 35 and 48. Kevin, what was our first one we talked about? I am the bread of life. I mean, if you think about it, in every culture, bread is the staple. It doesn't matter if you're in Israel, it doesn't matter if you're in America, unleavened or leavened, bread is still the, the steady. Like you sit at a table, they bring you out bread, right? So I, I love this. Jesus is saying, I am everything that you have. So in the Gospel of John, you have seven I am's and then you have seven signs, okay? Different things that all point to and testify, remember, testify about Christ. John the Baptist testifies about him. The scriptures testify about him. The Father testify about him. And Jesus' own works testify about him. And so as we look into John 7, it, it, to me, it's kind of a fun picture because I feel like when, we were, when I'm studying this, I feel like we took a radical, like, uh, like a radical turn. Just like, whoa, where did that come from? Like literally, because we're going to talk about, you ready for this? The Holy Spirit today. But like nowhere in scripture do you think in the New Testament at this point, are you anticipating talk of the Holy Spirit? And so I was kind of like in John 7, I was like, man, Lord, how does this fit in the Son of God? He's like, no, just talk about the Holy Spirit in John 7. So I just I want to emphasize, like it does feel like a little bit of out of place, but as you begin to study the context, it totally makes sense. Now in the first nine verses of John 7, what you're going to see is, is a little bit of family dynamics. You know, classic, the family doesn't believe Jesus. I mean, just different things, different dynamics. And then as a result, Jesus then in verses 10 through 24, after his brothers had gone into the festival, they're going to the festival of the tabernacles, right? Uh, then Jesus, then he secretly leaves, so he doesn't go with his family. And then as it begins to unfold in verses 25 through 36, we begin to talk about more and more about people are questioning the identity of uh, the Messiah. Like, is this really the Messiah? So this is the context. You have the festival of tabernacles taking place. Now, I think this would be a good question for Kevin McElravey. These are always good ones for Kevin. Kevin, there were three festivals that were always required for people to go to Jerusalem. Can you list them, Kevin? Uh, Passover. Yep, you got one. Uh, the festival, the booths, the tabernacles. Yep. You got, and then one more. It's more. Festival of Unleavened Bread? No. Pentecost. Oh, Pentecost. That's pretty good, though, Kevin. So you have Passover. Okay. I was impressed. Pentecost. And then the one that we're going to talk about today is Festival of Tabernacles. All right. This is the one we're going to talk about, the Festival of Tabernacles. Okay. Every Jewish family within 20 miles of Jerusalem was required to go. Okay. So your distance was 20 miles. Uh, and then at the same time, you got to remember, okay, the Festival of Tabernacles is this. As Nelson says, it's seven days where the people would literally, in they would makeshift shelters made of branches and uh, leaves. And it commemorated the days when the Israelites wandered in the wilderness and then they lived in tents. Okay, so Kevin, can you go to Leviticus 23 verse 40? So that's, that's the context, okay? And again, just so everybody knows, seven days, okay, is the Festival of Tabernacles. Okay, on the first day, I want you to take the product. I'm in Leviticus 23, 40. The product of majestic trees, palm fronds, bows of leafy trees, willows of the brook, and rejoice before the Lord God for how long? Seven days. Verse 41. You are to celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. How long? Seven days each year. This is a permanent statute for you throughout your generations. You must celebrate it in the seventh month. Verse 42. You're to live in booths, for seven days. All the native born of Israel must live in booths, and it goes to verse 43, so that your generations, so every year I want you to do this on the seventh month for seven days, so that your generations may know that I made the Israelites live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Every time he wants people to understand, oh, by the way, while you're in the wilderness, did you understand I took care of you? You had the booths, you had the tabernacles. Oh, by the way, I want people to remember Right? Moses is writing this and Jesus is still celebrating this. I, I just think this is an incredible concept. I mean, you know, think about this. If you were to ask a typical younger person today in America, what is Memorial Day? I watched an interview actually of this just recently. 
And most people don't have a clue in the younger generation, what is Memorial Day? Like people don't even know why we celebrate what we celebrate. I mean, it's soldiers who gave up their lives so that we could have freedom. And so if you're not constantly celebrating and remembering all the, these things, right, from the past, then the future generations forget these things. And so the purpose of the Festival of Tabernacles is to remember that God took care of his people, that God provided shelter for his people. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now, in this context, okay, on the last day, I'm in verse 37 now, on the last and most important day of the festival. Now, here is, I can just tell you now, where there's already an argument. If you look at most theologians, most commentaries, some will say seven, this is day seven, and some will say day eight. Now, we just read in Leviticus, it said seven days, seven days, seven days. Again, I would like to lean more towards the seven days. All I know is that on the last day of this festival, this is important. And it says this, Jesus, he stood up, that's important, rarely do they stand up, typically they'd sit down, which is implying this is really important. He stood up and he cried out, if anyone is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. Now, this is an odd thing to say, unless you begin to understand the context of how things unfold. So I'm gonna walk you through, okay? I had to do a lot of studying on this, okay? So just understand like this wasn't just like, oh yeah, I figured this one out on my own. <laughs> Not at all. Between Nelson's and John MacArthur, we're going to sandwich some things together. Now, on each day of the feast, so seven days, on every day of the festival, the people would come, and we read this in Leviticus 23, they'd come with palm branches and they would march around the great altar. So every day they would recognize, along with, obviously, I should say this, the high priest, okay, they would recognize all that God's done every single day. Now, one priest would be with them. Now, that's the high priest. Now, another priest, he would take a golden pitcher, okay, filled with water. Does anybody know where this water would come from? Any idea? It's a pool. Rich, you've probably been there. There's two pools that we've been to in Israel. The Pool of Siloam. Pool of Siloam. So they would bring a golden pitcher, okay, a priest, bring a golden pitcher filled with water from the Pool of Siloam. And then what would he do? He would carry it to the temple. Okay, so on these days, now this is important to understand because Jesus in John 7, 37, if anybody is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. Okay, so you got to understand here, a priest is bringing a golden pitcher with water from the pool of Siloam and he's carrying it to the temple. Okay, and what he would do is, this is kind of interesting. It says, and he would pour, okay, into a silver basin onto the brazen altar as an offering to God. So he'd pour the water into a silver basin, which then would go into the brazen altar, and then this would be as an offering to God. Interesting enough, Tom Constable would said that when he's carrying this pitcher, they were all walking through what one person called the water gate. All right, so now watch. Constable would unfold this as well. So the, the priest, okay, there's one priest, he's pouring the water into the basin, right? Then there's another priest at the same time, and he was pouring, this is kind of interesting, a drink offering of wine into another offering. Okay, so you have water being dropped and then you have wine being dropped. Okay, kind of a cool picture here. Now this water into the basin was pouring into water. It symbolizes a couple things. Again, you can look at it in different ways. The water symbolized God's provision in the past and the future. And then the wine, God's bestowal of, of the Spirit of God. So basically you have God's presence in the past, present, and future, and then you have the Spirit of God as well. So you have people pouring water and pouring wine. Now, every day at that point, the crowds, okay, they would begin to chant multiple psalms. Okay, so Kevin, can you go to Psalm 118, verse uh, 1? Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. This is what they were saying, okay? The crowd was chanting, okay? Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Save now, I pray, O Lord. Okay, then it would go to Psalm 118, verse 25. Okay, so this is, the pro this is such a process, right? Lord, save us, right? Please grant us, Lord, please grant us success. So you go from Psalm 118, verse 1, to Psalm 118, verse 25. So you're saying, Lord, thank you, Lord. And now they're saying, Lord, 
praise God, but please send prosperity. Please send us success. Now, what they would do again, they'd end it again. Kevin, go to Psalm 118, verse 1 again. And then they would repeat it. O Lord, right, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. So as they're pouring the water and the wine, and then these people are ch uh, chanting or giving thanks or giving praise to the Lord. Now, as they're doing this, remember, they have the myrtle, the will, and as we read in Leviticus 23, the palm branches that, uh, at, that they came to the altar and it served as, um, uh, they, they're just, they're coming before the Lord in His presence. That's what they're doing. And so then after a pause, after doing these things, then the sacrifices were offered. All right, this is what, I'm going to go back to Nelson, okay? So you can see this is a process here, okay? Now at this time, it says this was a dramatic ceremony that was a memorial of the water, okay, that came from the rock when the Israelites traveled through the wilderness. So this water, not only is God's present, and past, present, future, but think about scenarios in the scripture where water was evident that God was real. So obviously, you guys remember when the whole rock scenario in Exodus 17, you don't need to go there, Kevin, one through seven, God poured the water out of the rock. God's presence. When I think of God's presence, I think of the Red Sea. I mean, just by the simple fact of God being there, man, oh man, you guys, he split the water. You know, there's so many things that begin to show over and over. Now, this ceremony was a memorial of the water, but now think about this. On the last day of the feast, seventh or eighth day, it depends who you ask, the people, you ready for this one, Kevin? This would get you excited. The people marched around the altar in memorial of what took place in Jericho seven times. There's a lot of stuff going on here. People are waving branches, water's being poured, wine's being poured. They're saying, thanks to the Lord. Lord, give us prosperity. And oh, by the way, they're walking seven times. And so at that moment, you guys, you have to understand something. Maybe, maybe when the priest is pouring the water, maybe that's when Christ began to say, if anybody is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. It's just a cool picture, you guys, of all of these people coming to the table, coming and saying, hey, uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you mean if anybody's thirsty, come to me? Like, it's that same imagery of the bread of life. No, I just want to have food. No, he's saying, no, if you want more than water, you come to me. If anybody is parched, if anybody is thirsty, and it says in verse 38, the one who believes in me, this is Jesus talking, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. So the one who believes in me, as the scripture said, well, wh where did it say in the scriptures? Again, this is that language of the scriptures testifying about Christ. Kevin, would you go to, uh, you know what? Can you go to Isaiah 55, one for a second? I I'm going to, I'm just going to totally go a rabbit trail here just for a second and then I'll come back. Think about this. Isaiah 55, one, come everyone who is thirsty, come to the waters. Okay, so there's the imagery of you come, you come, you come. Go to Isaiah 12, 3, okay? I, I know I just took a quick rabbit trail, but I want to show you will joyfully draw water from the springs of salvation. So this imagery, again, of this water pointing to uh, satisfying your thirst, bringing about, look, the springs of salvation. Now let's go, Kevin, if we can. I think this is a cool picture. Numbers 24, verse 7. The one who believes in me, as the scriptures have said. Now look at Numbers 24, seven. Water will flow from his buckets and his seed will be by abundant water. His king will be greater than Agag and his kingdom will be exalted. So this, it's such a weird image. Water's gonna flow from his buckets and his seed will be abundant. Christ understands this imagery. If you knew what scripture said, can you go to Isaiah 58, verse 11? Isaiah 58, verse 11, same mentality, you guys. The Lord will always lead you, and this is such a cool picture, satisfy you in a parched land and strengthen your bones. You will be like a watered garden, like a spring whose waters never run dry. I don't care how hard you try, the water will never run out. And that's what Jesus stands up and he says, if anybody is thirsty, you can come to me because what I'm saying is, is exactly what the scriptures are talking about Zechariah 14, 8. Zechariah 14, verse 8. Another powerful picture. On that day, living water, living water will flow out of from Jerusalem. 
half of it toward the Eastern Sea and the other half toward the Western Sea in summer and winter alike. Living water will flow out of Jerusalem. You're going to begin to see a fulfillment at this point, literally, of all that the feast anticipated. Jesus is saying, yes, this is me. We're going to go back to John 7, Kevin, verse 39. But what does this look like? Now, hey, Rich, before we get farther, you had talked about a great, uh, this imagery uh, took you back to another story in John 4. Yeah, it just made me think of the conversation he had with the woman at the well, talking about springs of living water would flow up from the well. So yeah. is it a well or is it a stream? So in John 4, 14, just as a, a I mean, it's an awesome point, Rich. John 4, verse 14 has this picture of, you know, what does Jesus say again? Whoever drinks from the water that I'll give him, again, same language, will never get thirsty again. But instead of the, the river flowing, he says the water I'll give him will become a well of water. That's a cool image though too, right? It's like this water that never runs out of this well. I mean, every time I go down there, it's still there. Every time I go down there, that water is still there. And then there's that river image of like, it's just constantly flowing. And Jesus says in verse 39, this flowing, this streams of living water, oh, by the way, it's the Holy Spirit. The reason that you'll never run dry is because the Spirit of God will be inside of you. Now, those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit but now look at this, for the Spirit had not yet been received because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now, big language here. When it says Jesus had not yet been glorified, it means he had not died, he had not been buried, and he had not come back to life. So we have not seen the resurrection yet. Because of that, the Spirit of God has not come inside those that believed in Christ. Amen? That's the image that we have. So up until this point, this is an important factor to make note that the Holy Spirit came on people in the Holy Spirit for certain times, certain assignments and certain roles. I mean, think about Numbers 27, verse 18. Kevin, if you'll go there, please. The Holy Spirit had a role in the Old Testament. It just he, the Holy Spirit was never inside of us. Now, if he is, it was only for a season, only for a role. Look at uh, Numbers 27, 18. Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man who has the Spirit in him, and lay your hands on him. The Holy Spirit, at any moment during that time, could have left Joshua. I think that's a fair statement. Once you believe in Christ, the Holy Spirit never leaves you. Okay, there's a big, big distinction here. That's why this concept of this river that's always flowing, or this well that's constantly being drawn from, it's because it's the Spirit of God that never leaves. Kevin, let's go to Ezekiel 2, verse 2. As he spoke to me, the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet, and I listened to the one who was speaking to me. It's a cool picture. Again, the Spirit of God came on the major prophet Ezekiel. Spirit of God entered him for a time, but just remember the Spirit of God no longer leaves us. Just so you know where we're coming from, two different scenarios. Kevin, can you go to 1 Corinthians 12, verse, I believe, 13? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Uh, look at this. It says, for we were all baptized by one spirit. Now look at this image, okay? Into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, ready? And we are all made to drink of one spirit. If you understand John 7 and you understand John 4, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, now makes sense. We are asked to drink of one spirit and you can drink all you want. You can come before the Lord and just keep coming before Him. Why? Because in Ephesians 1, verse 13 through 14, uh, just so you know, this is, this is how this works to me. In Ephesians 1, verse 13, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed in Him, you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Now in verse 14, He is the down payment of our inheritance. When you trust Christ, Christ says, good, here's your down payment of what's to come for the redemption of the possession to the praise of His glory. The Holy Spirit is at work inside of us. The question is, do you tap into the Holy Spirit? One of the reasons I think we look like in America we're a dead and dry church is because we don't tap into the deep well of the Spirit of God inside of us. Why? Because the Spirit of God makes some of us really, really nervous. It's the craziest thing. The Spirit of God is there for us to speak to us and to give us life. Scripture then just says this uh, in verse 40, 
When some from the crowd heard these words, they said, this really is the prophet, right? Deuteronomy 18, they're, they're expecting the prophet. And others said, well, hang on here. This is the Messiah. But then some said, surely the Messiah doesn't come from Galilee, does he? Crazy enough, in verse 42, it says, doesn't the scripture say that the Messiah comes from David's offspring and from the town of Bethlehem where David once lived? They, they just didn't do their homework. These people didn't do their homework. They naturally thought Jesus was, was with who? They naturally thought Jesus was primarily only from, from Galilee. And the craziest thing to me was, if they understood Scripture, if they understood Jesus, they would know, oh, this is the Son of God. So here's a question that I want to close with. And Kent Hughes, um, Kent Hughes does a great job of how do we learn to drink from this? Like, how, how do we learn to drink from the rivers of living water? How do we learn to drink from the well? Like, how do we tap into, right? How do we tap into this? Well, first of all, Kent Hughes says this, okay? I'm going to write these up here on the board, and why not? Let's write them in. Let's write them in blue. Okay, you guys? Somebody? Hello? Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Good idea. Thanks, guys. First of all, we need to realize our thirstiness. Is that a word? We need to realize our thirstiness and our emptiness. I like this thought because you basically are starting to say, where am I at? Am I thirsty for him or am I empty and I don't even know I need him? Part of pursuing the word revival, part of the word of praying for a revi being revived in our own lives is for people to realize wh where are they at? It's just, it's a check of, of a water level, right? So, I don't know, Kevin, Rich, Jeff, Tom, Tom, Tom's got some new features over there. He's pretty excited about his camera. Um, how do you guys evaluate where you're at? How do you tap into saying, you know, this is really where I'm at? Like, what, what level factors help you figure that out? Well, I think one of the biggest ones is where, where does your mind go? It's good. You know, what you think on says a lot where your where your heart is. You know, uh, for me, uh, my wife is never shy of telling me. Uh, and like her gauge is really, really good. Like she'll be like, hey, let's just pray. And if I don't desire to pray, I typically think, and you, you know when there's those moments, you're like, I just, I just want to sit down for a second. Like I, I don't really want to pray right now. And like at that moment, the challenge for me is, is oh, where am I finding my satisfaction then? Am I finding my satisfaction in just sitting down with my feet up or am I actually talking to the Lord, wanting him to bring about that, that comfort and that satisfaction? So sometimes my wife is my water gauge, <laughs> you know, or, or my kids. Like, where's my patience level with my kids? If I'm not being patient, I can promise you my water level, my spirit level is a little bit running low. I think that's a very fair assessment. So, uh, but at the same time, um, yeah, I don't know. You guys have any other ways? Rich, Tom, do you guys have any other ways to gauge where you're at with the Lord? For me, it's just how am I responding to things, whether it's a situation or people. And so if I'm short or, you know, then obviously that's a, a sign for me that I need to go draw it from the well or just get back with the Lord and seek Him. That's good. You know, I was on a train in Atlanta uh, just a couple days ago. It's kind of interesting. There was... Um, uh, a lady sitting right in front of my wife, a younger lady, and she had a big old tattoo right here on the arm, like on the upper shoulder. And it was a blue jay. And right away, I was like, okay, Lord, give me a word. Do you want me to have a word for her based on her tattoo? So I automatically looked up the meaning of a blue jay, right? Multiple meanings. And, and I, the crazy thing is the reason I did, because like I've seen more blue jays in the last three weeks, maybe in my life around my house. And so I'm intrigued about what is the Lord doing here? And so I, in my mind, Right? I'm thinking, oh yeah, I'm going to give this lady a word. I start looking up the meaning of a blue jay and the Lord just totally spoke to my heart. And it was interesting to me how uh, as you seek the Lord, right? Remember we talked about this yesterday. If you're open to hearing the Lord differently, he'll, he'll keep filling you up. And as weird as it sounds, through a Google search on a blue jay, part of the meaning of blue jay is that you know, there's, there's curiosity. It means clarity and vision. And I, I just, you know, you can read into all those kind of things, right? So just hear me out. The Lord knew how to speak to my heart. And that, that's how I've been praying for clarity and for vision. And those were the two words that helped describe a blue jay. And I just thought, man, Lord, 
Thank you, because I was seeking, that's the key, you guys, because I was seeking, coming after, he kept filling me up. So then I left yesterday, like, on the train, as Mitch says, it was, it was, it was crazy, you guys. Uh, there was a guy that came up, and remember we talked about the poor? Remember the rich man and Lazarus? And then one of the verses was, you should look the poor in the eyes and never look away. I was like, Lord, I'm looking this guy straight in the eyes. Like, literally, he sang a song for two and a half minutes on asking for money, and I stared at him the entire time. Super awkward. I was like, yeah, I noticed you looked at him a lot. I was like, yeah, I know. It's kind of weird. But you know what? You know where that came from? You know where that strength comes from? The Word of God. When you seek Him, He will speak to you and fill you up. So we got to come to terms, you guys, on whether or not we are thirsty or are we empty. Okay, number two is, is that, you know, and this is kind of a simple one, but we need to just admit that nothing... This is, this is really obvious, but man, it's, it's key. That nothing we have within us, um, how do I want to phrase this? Nothing that we have in us will, I would say, I don't know if I want to say commit to Christ because that's a weird, because it, my, my point is this. Like, it's not us is what I'm after here. Like, it's nothing of, obviously, we have the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? So I'm not, not saying we don't have the Spirit of God, but I think it's the point of, the, like, the flesh inside of us. Nothing of us can manufacture our commitment to Christ. You have to literally turn to the Spirit of God, to the, the rivers of living water, or to the well of this, this life spring of water. Like, that's the point. And the more you keep trying to, keep trying to do it to us and to try to tap it into us, like, we'll literally constantly be falling short. And so you have to understand that we need to admit, okay, we are all <laughs> sinners. So these kind of lend to each other. But that's important to understand because number four, and the reason I'm telling you guys these two and three are really important is because if you don't realize two and three, then you'll never ask about number four. Ask to be, as it says in Ephesians, ask to be filled daily. Ask to be filled daily by the Spirit of God. So I think that this is a progression here. You realize where you're at, realize it's not our flesh, realize there's nothing in us, which is why we have to every single day, Holy Spirit, fill me up. Paul prayed, fill them up. Fill them up with the Spirit of God. And Jesus says in John 7, verse 37, as we close out here, <laughs> what does he say? He says, if anybody's thirsty, you should come to me and drink. And literally, I think it's a fair statement. Constable says this as well. This verse right here is literally the pivotal verse in the Gospel of John that starts to bring about hostility. This is the verse that starts to turn the table and saying, wait a minute, it's not about you. There's, there's something that, what, what are you talking about? And Jesus says, no, you, you come to me to drink. I will fulfill and satisfy all of your needs. It's a cool picture, you guys. John 7, Lord willing, uh, this encourage you in any way, shape, or form. It's the Word of God. Despite what I say, this Word of God should radically change your life on a, on a daily basis. All right, guys, have a great day, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.